My favorite thing to browse on Kempom is the stats trends page. There you can find how the game has changed statistically on a year by year basis. This season, average height is the stat that has interested me the most, meaning how tall the average D1 player is weighted by minutes played. So far this year, we're going to break the record for tallest season, a record which was already broken just last season. Anecdotally, that makes sense. Teams like Michigan and Florida have been experimenting with starting three bigs in the same lineup. Florida has done it with Tommy Houck at the three. Michigan has done it with Yaxel Lendeborg. Also, now that player salaries are so high, there's been an influx of international players in college basketball. A larger recruiting pool presumably leads to taller players. But if we go back to Kempom, the interesting part is that three-point attempt rate is still increasing despite teams playing bigger. 2025 was the highest three-point volume season of all time. 2026 has a chance to top it. To investigate this further, I pulled up player height data from CBBanalytics.com. I compared the 2025 season to 2020 to see how things have changed. In 2020, 46% of shot attempts by players 6 foot 4 and under were threes. Exactly the same three point attempt rate as in 2025. So guards aren't shooting more threes, but wings and bigs are. 21% of shot attempts by players 6 foot 9 and over were threes in 2025, three percentage points higher than 2020. And if we narrow in on just seven footers, that select group of players has increased their three point volume by six percentage points. These numbers are probably a combination of a couple of things. First, bigs are just increasingly becoming more skilled shooters. But also, coaches are positioning their bigs out on the perimeter more. It's not just about skill, it's also about opportunity. Although obviously those two factors are related, more skill likely leads to more opportunity. I've shown in past videos how teams use duck-ins when playing with two bigs to carve out driving angles in the paint. Florida versus Arizona on opening night was the quintessential example of that. Those two programs plus Gonzaga have set the standard in recent years for how to use duck-ins while ball screens are occurring to own the paint. But what about the big not ducking in, the one playing on the perimeter? Even though shooting has improved, there are still plenty of bigs out there that don't shoot the three. But in this video, I'm going to show you how playing a big on the perimeter changes the geometry of the court, even if that player is not a shooter. I also have some film from the 2012 season to better illustrate how ball screens and dribble handoffs have evolved now that bigs initiate outside the three point line. We'll compare 2012 to present day, but first, let's look at some numbers that show why teams are valuing height. This is a list of the 10 tallest teams in the country this season. There are some big names here like Duke and UNC. Duke in particular has really prioritized recruiting tall guards in recent seasons, making it easier for them to switch all screens and not give up a mismatch inside. But this list has some not so good teams on it as well. Bryant has started four players that are six foot eight or taller, yet they rank in the 300s in Kempa. I split teams into two different groups, the 50 tallest teams in the country and the 50 shortest, and then compared the four factors of each group. So for example, the tall teams have rebounded 35% of their missed shots this season. The short teams have only rebounded 29%. It's a similar situation for shooting and drawing fouls. The tall teams are better. Turnovers are the one category where the average tall team doesn't dominate. When looking into this type of data, you actually find that height tells you a little bit more about a team's defense than it does offense. Tall teams are a little better on average on D. That being said, we know correlation doesn't imply causation, and it's probably not a good idea, for example, to play five bigs all at the same time just for the sake of having the tallest team possible. Teams have, however, found a lot of success recently playing two bigs together. And in order to show you how, we have to talk about the two main types of ball screens. Let's go over some terminology. When a big starts inside the paint or on the block and then runs out to screen on the perimeter, I call that a rush out screen. 
In previous eras of basketball, bigs were usually positioned in the paint, so the rush out was the main way to get them into a ball screen. Ideally, on these rush outs, the big sprints into his screen, making it harder for the defensive big to stay connected and execute his coverage. Here's an example of Gonzaga occupying both blocks with their bigs, then using the rush out to end a possession with a screen. And on this one, it's Florida with two bigs in the paint, but they use row replace action after the rush out occurs to open up the paint. The other type of ball screen that we need to define is the throw and chase. This is where a big starts on the perimeter, passes to a guard, and then follows his pass to set a ball screen. It's kind of similar to a dribble handoff, which we'll also be talking about soon. The thing about the throw and chase or the DHO is that it's hard to execute certain defensive coverages against them. Let's first think about the rush out from a defensive perspective. Icing a rush out screen where the opponent sends the ball to the sideline is relatively easy to execute. The big stays connected to the screener at first and yells out ice. That signals for the guard to change his foot angles, and then the big temporarily leaves his man to get into ice position. Here's what it should look like. Aaron Kraft isn't letting the ball handler use the screen, and Amir Williams is there to stop the baseline drive. But now let's think about how this would work if it was a throw and chase. Imagine this Gonzaga player started at the top of the key and went to ball screen. Now Williams would have to get all the way to the baseline side coming from the other direction. Direction. It makes these perimeter based actions extremely hard to ice. Here's a perimeter throw and chase from Kentucky where Otega Owe rejects the screen. Notice how quick the screen happens. The defensive big has no chance to get on the baseline side of the screen, even if he wanted to. Now, if we look at Kentucky's national championship team in 2012, they used Anthony Davis out on the perimeter, but primarily in dribble handoffs, not throw and chase screens. Also, a lot of those handoffs happen below the three-point line, leading to long two-point jumpers when the defense went under the DHO. Nowadays, with guards more willing to shoot off the dribble threes, it's harder than ever to go under DHOs. And that's part of the reason why zoom action has become so popular and effective. Just like with the throw and chase screens, it's hard to execute your coverage against Zoom because of the angle and the pace of the action. I remember during the 2019 NCAA tourney, Virginia decided to hedge those Purdue handoffs. It was a fascinating chess match between the best Zoom offense in the country and the best hedge defense. But like I said, hedging is usually pretty rare against DHOs or Zoom. If we go back again to 10 to 15 years ago, teams didn't usually flow as seamlessly as they do today into throw and chase screens or handoffs. Here, Ricardo Ratliff catches on the perimeter and there's no urgency to get into the next action. He just passes the ball back and walks into a ball screen. Or here, Robert Lewandowski gets a catch, but he goes to screen away instead of ball screen. His teammate then points for him to screen the ball instead, but the flow just isn't there as he trots into a pick and pop. One more example with Kyle Wilcher, he catches on the perimeter but is just trying to survive. No zoom action, no throw and chase, just a handoff that comes way out beyond the three point line in a non-scoring area. Compare that to present day, offenses like Florida and Arizona like to immediately throw the ball to their trail big man as soon as it crosses half court, ultimately setting up a fast paced throw and chase. Not all of the Florida or Arizona bigs are great outside shooters, but they're capable of putting the ball on the floor and it allows them to invert the offense. The bigs act as the playmaker and the guards are playing off of them. There's also an element of unpredictability. The big doesn't have to hand the ball off. He can keep it in drive or let the guard wrap around him towards the basket. On this play, instead of a ball screen, Florida naturally flows into two backdoor cuts, just reading what the opponent is giving them. If a defense tries to guard the flow ball screen by putting two players on the ball, this is the spot on the court where a team like the Gators can kill you. 
the short roll with a four on three advantage. Again, the great perimeter flow just makes it so the defense has to pick their poison in terms of what coverage to use. Here it's UNC flowing right into a little dribble pitch, and they get the roll dunk after Kansas puts two on the ball. Now that's not to say a team shouldn't use rush out screens. There are creative ways to make it harder for the big to stay attached on that rush out. For example, Alabama loves to use the Ram screen before a rush out, where they have a player screen the eventual ball screener first to make it harder for the defensive big to keep up with the play. Another trick for making rush outs harder for the defense to guard is to flip the screen by changing the angle at the last second. That concept is sometimes called a Verizhou, and Iowa is the best team I've seen this season at executing it. Flipping the screen makes it harder for the screen defender to stay ahead of the play while getting into his coverage. A team like Arizona generally has great offensive flow, but sometimes it's just about keeping it simple and getting your two best players involved in the action. The Jaden Bradley Koa Pete short roll is hard to guard regardless of how you get into it. No fancy action is really needed for them to create efficient looks. Also, when a defense tries to deny or blow up the throw and chase or zoom, the offense can get clunky at times. A big dribbling around the perimeter trying to find a partner to play with him doesn't always go as smoothly as planned. But it does sure help when that big has the skill set of someone like Tommy Houck, who's capable of calling his own number and driving through the teeth of the defense if the flow does start to get clunky. If an offense puts four guards on the court, you're inviting the defense to switch one through four on all handoffs and screens. By comparison, playing with two true bigs can force the opponent into some tough decisions if those bigs are being employed optimally. Obviously, playing big produced a national championship just last season. It's a style that's been effective for elite college teams. But of course, not everyone has the luxury of recruiting so much talented size. The real lesson here is to get your best players on the court and then develop a system for them that maximizes their skill set sets, whatever it is that those skill sets might be. I often use data and analytics in my videos to break down league trends. If you've ever been watching and wish you could learn more about the statistics being used or just basketball analytics in general, I have the solution for you. Ken Pomeroy and I created an online course that teaches you how to think about the game from a modern perspective. The basketball analytics course can be taken entirely at your own pace, and you can use the promo code YouTube for a discount. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.